In this video, we'll be learning about hemocompatibility testing. The learning objectives for this video are to understand how hemocompatibility is assessed. So we'll be talking about experimental setups and methods for testing hemocompatibility in vitro. We'll also be talking about the approaches and methods for testing hemocompatibility ex vivo and in vivo, and specifically when to perform ex vivo and in vivo testing, which depends on the specific device. The other learning objective is to recognize the importance of ISO 10993-4 in hemocompatibility testing. So we know that blood contacting medical devices can fail due to localized blood clotting on the device, but also due to the systemic effects of As we've discussed previously, blood contacting medical devices can fail due to localized blood clotting on the device or due to systemic effects of device-mediated coagulation, for example, due to thrombus embolization in which a piece of the clot breaks off and then travels to a distal organ. They can also fail due to complement activation, specifically via this alternative activation pathway in which uh, C3B adsorption triggers activation of complement, or due to hemolysis, which is the lysis of red blood cells. As we think about these possible modes of failure, we now need to build up a toolkit of testing methods or approaches to assess hemocompatibility. ISO 10993 is the broader set of biocompatibility testing standards from the International Standards Organization and ISO 10993-4 specifically provides guidance on hemocompatibility testing. Here I'm showing you Table 2 from this standard that lists common tests used to assess interaction with blood and hemocompatibility. And you'll see here we have hemolysis, which is one of our concerns. We have thrombosis, which is our other concern. And then we have complement activation. So platelet activation here that's related to thrombosis, of course, and then coagulation as well. So these are all different test methods that are sort of summarized here in the standard. So if we look at them in a little bit, um, so we'll talk about the distinction between in vitro, in vivo, and ex vivo methods. Uh, but here we can see a little bit about the methods that are going to be used. So for hemolysis, these, this doesn't tell you about the actual method that's used, but you're looking for some way to quantify hemoglobin uh, production or release, rather. For thrombosis, we can do gross analysis. So this specifically pertains to the in vivo and ex vivo assays. You can do gross analysis where you're looking at the surface. You look at percent occlusion, uh, do scanning electron microscopy, light microscopy. In vitro, we can look at coagulation uh, a little bit in more detail so we can look at specific things associated with thrombosis. So we can look for the production of thrombin, production of fibrin using assays. So um, we can also use this PTT assay, which is a partial thromboplastin time assay. Basically, these are just assessing in this one, in this case, how quickly the blood clots, uh, but we can look for specific proteins associated with the coagulation cascade. And for that, we can use ELISA measurements. We can also use ELISA measurements to look for complement activation. So looking for specific proteins associated with the complement cascade. And then for platelet activation, we can look for uh, release products coming from activated platelets. So again, ELISAs can be used for that or we can look at platelet attachment. So we can do that with microscopy. Scanning electron microscopy is a good tool for that. And then we can look at platelet morphology because we know that their morphology changes when they become activated. So they go from that discoid morphology to the really uh, irregular shaped morphology where they, uh, after they contract. So in the grand scheme of device development, you know, we have this spectrum that goes from in vitro testing to animal testing to clinical trials. And as we've talked about previously in class, so biomaterial selection has typically been driven by the choice of the most inert and least toxic materials. 
that have the most appropriate mechanical properties. And with this in mind, in vitro testing, its role is to tell us if a material is inert or toxic. So in the context of hemocompatibility testing, that's what we're going to think about in terms of inertness. Like, is there activation of the coagulation cascade of complement? Is there platelet adhesion, etc.? So now let's dive into the in vitro testing methods a little bit. So in vitro blood exposure models, they're attractive um, for a variety of reasons, which are summarized here. So one reason is cost. It's much cheaper than doing everything in an animal model. But also, we have high reproducibility, uh, and so you can really control the system very well in vitro. Um, so you can have this high replication testing of your test object, so that's the device uh, that you're testing against controls and reference materials using the same batch of blood at the same time. And why that's important is because there can be some variability um, in, in the blood, depending on you know, when it was collected, even if you're using human blood, the person that it was from, there's a little bit of variability in the, uh, the amount of proteins that are present uh, and associated with the coagulation cascade. And the, um, also it, the age of the blood can affect um, platelet activation and things. Also, uh, the flow, temperature, and anticoagulation in particular has to be standardized. So in the last video, we showed the effects of citrate on blood uh, with that video on the chicken blood. But anytime we're collecting blood to use in in vitro hemocompatibility tests, we have to anticoagulate it with citrate or something else. And that protocol has to be standardized, otherwise there's gonna be variability in how well the blood can clot. In vitro testing also represents kind of a worst case scenario testing because there's no clearance by other organs in this system. So it's kind of, it's just closed in the in vitro environment. Uh, so you're going to get more accumulation of things. Uh, so there's going to be more susceptibility to uh, thrombosis, for example. And then lastly, we can isolate um, our material and its effects from confounding factors related to implantation and injury that are associated with the in vivo use. So we're really just isolating the effects of the material. And then when it comes to in vitro testing, our approaches can be either static or dynamic. So the in vitro testing, the static, it's just soaking. And then in dynamic testing, the blood is circulating. And up at the top of these images, this is just showing platelet adhesion onto the surface of uh, different polymers here. And you can see how different they are. Um, that's not so relevant here, but this is just kind of the type of data that you might get where you'd look at the number of platelets attached, and then you could characterize their morphology as well. For dynamic testing, one of the very common te test methods is the Chandler loop as illustrated here. It's basically what it sounds like. So you have a loop of tubing material, you put some blood inside of it, and then you put your biomaterial specimen inside of it, and then it rotates. And so that provides that circulation. So I've got a brief video here on YouTube to show you. It's a little bit less than two minutes long, I believe. So I've got the audio muted on this, but I'll narrate as the video plays. Of course, you have to have fresh blood. You have a suitable tubing that you're going to put the blood in. And then this is, they're showing how they're going to cut the tubing. Um, after they cut it, they're putting their test material in. So this is actually a uh, guide wire. And then that clamp's just going to be used to close it. But first, of course, you have to add the blood. And they clamp it shut.
And then now they're going to put it into a water bath, so that controls the temperature at physiologic temperature. And then they, once they get it secured, they're going to turn on the motor and it begins to rotate. And then now you can see how the blood is circulating and moving over that guide wire that was placed in there. But you can use any material for this that you can fit inside the tubing. So that's the Chandler loop in action. So when we're doing in vitro testing for hemocompatibility, the following questions can be answered. So do platelets adhere and become activated? And to assess this, we're gonna have to image our surface. So we could use light microscopy or scanning electron microscopy. And then we're going to quantify the number and the shape of platelets. We can also measure the release of the granule contents. So we previously learned about the, the different granules that platelets contain and they release factors associated with the coagulation cascade. We can also ask is thrombosis triggered or inhibited? Um, we're most concerned about the triggering of course because we don't want thrombosis on our device and for this we can measure the clotting time. So that would be done with for example that partial, partial thromboplastin time assay that was on the previous slide. So clotting time assay is similar to what we showed in the previous lecture when we were looking at uh, coagulation activated via the intrinsic pathway. And if we were to look at this, we can just look for coagulation. So again, this can be done imaging based uh, to assess if there's you know, thrombosis. To answer, we can also answer is complement activated. And again, we're measuring, so looking for these complement factors, see if there are any being produced. And then finally, are red blood cells being lysed? In this case, we're looking for hemoglobin that would be released. In vitro testing, again, will tell us only if the materials is inert or toxic. If we really want to assess performance, we have to do device testing. And so for this, our goal is to predict whether a medical device presents potential harm to the patient or another way of putting that would be risk. And we have to do that by evaluating it under conditions that simulate clinical use. So, so that's very important. And that's gonna be also our distinction between ex vivo and in vivo testing. So in vitro testing is simple and cheap, but it only provides a limited assessment. So we're usually gonna to have to go to ex vivo and in vivo testing to really prove that it doesn't pose a risk. This is another table from ISO 10993-4. Contains a lot of information, I know, uh, but this is kind of recommendations for the categories of appropriate testing that should be considered for different devices. And it breaks them up into external communicating devices and implant devices. So uh, here you can see we have our hemolysis. Again, we have our thrombosis assays looking at coagulation, platelets, and complement. We haven't really talked about the hematology assays where we're looking at the um, leukocyte activation, uh, but that's something else that is done. Um, and then we have in vivo and ex vivo testing, and you can see that in many cases that is recommended, all these ones down here where there's an X. We have to go to this animal testing. All right, well, what do we mean by external communicating device anyway? So an external communicating device is one that contacts circulating blood and it serves as a conduit into the vascular system. So in other words, it's taking blood or blood is going from in the body, outside the body into this device and then back into the body. So examples of this would be cardiopulmonary bypass machines or heart lung machines, extracorporeal membrane oxygenators or ECMO machines, and then hemodialysis machines. In contrast, implant devices are placed largely or entirely within the vascular system. So these are things like heart valves, vascular grafts, stents, etc. So if we think about these types of devices and the important point that our testing should replicate the clinical scenario or the clinical use, then an ex vivo test system um, is going to be important for these external communicating devices. So by ex vivo, 
we mean one that shunts blood directly from a subject, either a human or an animal, into a test chamber that's located outside the body, and then it comes back in. And I'll show you a diagram of that in a bit. Whereas an in vivo test system involves implantation. So ex vivo tests are performed for the external communicating devices and in vivo tests are performed for implant devices. Last important point when we're doing this testing, we should be testing the complete sterilized device or device component. Another way of saying that is the final device. So a lot of times in uh, medical device development, you'll hear people talk about a design lock where they're not going to make any more changes. So that's what they mean, like it's the final device. So devices, again, whose intended use is ex vivo, got to be tested ex vivo. If they're intended to be implanted, got to be tested in vivo. And then the animal model that is used should simulate as closely as possible the conditions of clinical use. So you have to take that into consideration. Also, if we're thinking about testing a final device, the animal must be large enough. Uh, so it must be able to uh, accommodate a human-sized device. So that kind of restricts the animals that we can use. Like if you're going to test, for example, a vascular assist device, you can't test that in a rat. You got to use a much larger animal, probably a sheep or something like that. So in vivo assessment of hemocompatibility provides more complete information than in vitro analysis but our specific test methods are going to depend on the device. So some concerns when designing an in vivo experiment, as I mentioned on the last slide, include your choice of animal. And this is very important because there are differences between uh, animal species in terms of the coagulation proteins and humans. So non-human primates, uh, such as baboons, they exhibit very close similarity uh, to humans. So they, um, are ideal in that way, but then there are some concerns with using non-human primates uh, in testing uh, ethically. Dogs are commonly used in uh, cardiovascular device testing, and they do provide useful information, but a note is that device-related thrombosis in dogs tends to occur more readily than in humans, but that's kind of an advantage when it comes to testing because that's a worst case testing. If something performs well in dogs and there's no thrombosis, then it should um, not pose a risk in humans. And then pigs and sheep, they're generally regarded as suitable animal models because of their hematological and cardiovascular similarities to humans. So uh, in terms of their coagulation mechanisms, they're similar enough. And then also in terms of the hemodynamics, the blood flow, uh, and the size of their cardiovascular organs are similar enough. Aside from choice of animal, the length of the study and the choice of time points are important. Um, that's going to depend on the device. Uh, and then whenever we're designing experiments, we have to include the proper control materials. So ex vivo testing, uh, this is again for external communicating devices. And in this case, we have a piece of tubular material that is going to be used as a shunt. Uh, so that's what's being illustrated in this figure down here. So you have your test material. So it's a piece of tubing, and then it is connected to an artery, and then connected to a vein, and so the blood flow will pass through this test material and then uh, after it exits the artery through the material and then back into the body via the vein. So this is really, it's the appropriate system for an external communicating device, but it also is a good 
test bed for looking at biomaterial compatibility. So if you're using a vascular graft, you could assess hemocompatibility that way, but it wouldn't be appropriate um, for the in vivo testing. You would have to do further work, but you could test like if a graft material uh, is compatible with blood in this model. And with that in mind, you know, the experimental conditions here, they're better controlled and there's minimal injury compared to implantation of uh, the material. So now our methods for evaluating hemocompatibility ex vivo and in vivo are described here. So for thrombosis, we're going to have gross observation and microscopic analysis of the device. So light microscopy or SEM. Uh, over here, these images of our propate and vascular graft versus the polytetrafluoroethylene graft, that's gross observation. And you can see lots of thrombosis on the surface in the control. We can also use gravimetric analysis. So uh, this is weighing how much thrombus forms, so getting that mass. But neither of these methods account for embolization because if you have embolization, it's not going to be there for you to visualize uh, and there's not going to be any mass from it. So for that, we also have to do histological analysis of distal organs to look for evidence of this thromboembolization. So that's common and the kidneys are typically our target because they're highly perfused and then uh, anything that breaks off is very likely going to end up in the kidneys. So that's actually what's shown down here. So this is a glomerulus that's shown here. And if you're looking at this histologically, you can tell if there's evidence of thromboembolization to the kidneys. You can also look for percent occlusion or patency. And if we go back to our studies on the propate and vascular graft, that was what was done. If you recall, patency was one of their metrics they were concerned with. So for this, we need imaging methods to look at the vessel and see how open it is, particularly, so this is very relevant to in vivo. So we need to use things like angiography, intravascular ultrasound, Doppler ultrasound, CT and MRI. So all the things that you're learning about in your medical imaging class that could be applied to these experiments to assess occlusion and patency. Last, we have blood testing. So we can do hematology testing to look at cells, so platelets, leukocytes, and clotting time, those standard things. We can check for hemolysis, um, as in our in vitro experiments. We can look for factors specific to coagulation and then platelet and leukocyte activation. And then we can look for factors specific to complement activation. So we'll stop there, and next up we'll be doing some exercises to reinforce hemocompatibility testing methods.